Hello, my name is Stephen King, and I'm a professor of government here at Regent University in the Department of Government and Criminal Justice in the College of Arts and Sciences. It's a delight and a joy to be with you and to present some findings from recent research that myself and two other colleagues out of the Robertson School of Government, Gary Roberts and Elijah Ashapong, have spent the last oh, about two years or so uh, researching and writing and uh, finally submitting to the Palgrave Handbook of Servant Leadership for publication. So over the next 10 to 12 minutes, I want to just provide you with a broad brushstroke overview of our research and uh, provide some implications for it to this particular roundtable discussion. So let me share my screen and then we can get started. Well, as all of you know, the mark of a servant leader is um, several, actually. Uh, servanthood, of course, is key, as this scripture out of Mark 1043 uh, indicates. Um, character of the individual, that which is imprinted upon an individual's heart and soul. And, of course, integrity, uh, standing for what is right uh, and standing in the face of what is wrong and leading appropriately. We decided that we wanted to highlight two of our own. Uh, Rear Admiral retired Larry Bauckham and Rear Admiral retired William McCarthy. Both of these gentlemen are currently teaching on a part-time basis with us at uh, the Robertson School of Government in their respective areas of expertise uh, primarily in the areas of public policy and international relations, diplomacy, and, and other courses, uh, security, et cetera. Both have a distinguished career, uh, careers in the U.S. Navy, beginning as naval aviators and traversing the ranks all the way up to rear admirals of aircraft carriers. Uh, Admiral Bauckham with the USS Carl Vinson and Admiral McCarthy with the USS George Washington. We wanted to highlight these two individuals who we are labeling servant soldiers because we believe that right here in the midst of our community at Regent University, we have two of the more dedicated, consecrated servant leaders uh, that we could find, and we believe that they have a tale to tell that can be uh, helpful and appropriate for our discussion here today. So basically, the chapter was an overview where we described and, and assessed the military careers of both Admirals Bauckham and McCarthy. We illustrated uh, their common and unique personality traits using four servant leader attributes drawn from the literature, and we grounded our findings in both empirical and conceptual literature, and our methodology was anchored, no pun intended, by very in-depth qualitative interviews, and those interviews were conducted over a period of about four months uh, divided between the three of us. We summarized our key learning points and made some and provided some implications as well. Now we anchored again these uh, attribute or these individuals of McCarthy and Balcom and their leadership styles and their leadership um, qualities under four attributes of servant leadership. First, we looked at the servant leadership attribute of servanthood, which is the ethos of surrendering our own personal interests and desires to promoting the greater good, or in the case of Christian servant leadership, under God's greater good. Secondly is stewardship, that is the managing of resources, including people, information, revenue, with excellence and wisdom. Third, is our God-honoring moral and ethical virtuous character. Again, as I mentioned earlier, character is that which is imprinted or emblazoned upon our heart and our soul, where we are to not only uh, lead by virtuous 
ethical and moral principles, but by common reasoning. And finally, we looked at the attribute of employee development, very important in the servant leadership lead literature, actually even in much of the other literature, literature such as values-based literature, transformational literature, et cetera. And this is where employees are empowered to engage in their work. But this empowerment does not come naturally. This empowerment comes based upon the role that servant leaders play in the lives and in the actions and behavior of the employees. So our methodology was an interpretive qualitative research approach where we use their experiences and their attitudes and their beliefs, behavior and other performances exemplified through these servant leader attributes. Uh, we did this again through in-depth interviews where we were hoping to probe deeply and determine what we referred to as critical incident examples. Uh, that we believed operationally developed and defined servant leadership as exhibited in the actions and behavior and life, lives of both Bauckham and McCarthy. We uh, analyzed the data based upon a general inductive approach, and we basically grouped them in some form of consistency along the four servant leadership attributes. And so with that, I want to provide just a few snippets because I want to give time for talking about the implications of this. Uh, so servanthood. Uh, Admiral, excuse me, Admiral McCarthy. Um, one example that he provided was, and I, I was able to communicate with him during this particular uh, period of time as he was uh, engaging in our, our interview process. And he talked about a time when he went down into the very bilge. And as any of you who are Navy personnel, you understand the bilge is the very bottom of the ship where all of the muck and the mire and the uh, everything else is at. It has to be cleaned in many respects. Oftentimes things can be lost in the bilge and to find things in the bilge is going to require some effort on your part. And usually that's reserved for those individuals who are lower ranked. But here is an admiral and he went down to the bilge. He didn't do this out of pride. He didn't do this to show how good he was. He did this because he wanted to serve those individuals who were lower ranked, but to let them know that he had their back. In fact, I believe he used that phraseology in our conversation. Here is one of the quotes that we took uh, for this uh, understanding of this. Here are some of your tools. There are more in there, meaning down in the bilge. He says, after you get the rest of these tools, provide me with a list of what you need and I will get them. He didn't say, I will try to get them. He said, I will get them. But I think what was more important was that he actually went into the bilge himself and was trying to find some of the tools. Um, there's obviously more within the con context of that particular aspect, but it shows you the degree to which a servant leader truly serves. A servant leader is not one who simply talks about serving, but a servant leader is one who actually does serve. Stewardship is our second at one of our se our second attribute. Uh, here, uh, Admiral Bauckham gave us an opportunity to talk about when he would post information, written information, usually at the beginning of new, uh, when they were moving out on new uh, maneuvers, um, and they would be gone for six months or nine months. But initially, he would have an opportunity to communicate to them, particularly as he went into a new command, in order to let them know just exactly who he was, what he was expecting, and how is he, he was expecting to do it. In other words, he wanted to make sure that he these individuals on this aircraft carrier, several thousand of them, understood who their leader was. So here's a great quote. Every time I go into a new command, I would develop a very simple one page posted around. It's called, here's the mission as I see it. Here's our vision for where we're going. Here's what we want to accomplish. Here are the principles that we're going to use to guide that. And again, he would argue, I communicated to this not just once, not just twice, but multiple times, letting them know that I, as their admiral, as their servant leader, wanted to communicate to them 
and to steward them this vision, this mission, these principles, in order to make sure that what they're out going to do, there's the 30,000 foot mark, but there are so many of the uh, so many of the other trees for the for of the forest itself. You can't just look at the forest. There are so many things that go into making sure that that mission is going to be accomplished. He stewarded all the resources. He stewarded all of the opportunities uh, put forth before him, particularly those under his command, including those individuals he was communicating with, and said, "I want to manage this uh, vessel." in the best way possible. Our fourth attribute is character. Cemented in biblical faith, uh, both of these individuals as true Christian leaders indicated character was one of the most important attributes any servant leader can have. This is an interesting one. It, it may, you may not see it entirely as it fits into this, but I see this as we were communicating in our interview. Uh, Admiral McCarthy said this. Now, remember, both of these gentlemen were naval aviators to begin with and moved up the ranks all the way up to rear admirals. He said, if you're going to fly airplanes and if you don't believe in the almighty, then why on earth would you do that? In other words, why would you fly these airplanes if you don't understand who God is and you're not willing to give yourself to him? That is, you are you are giving yourself, you're putting yourself into his hands, then you are here for a purpose. Your purpose is to fly Navy jets. Then you have to accept the life. You have to accept the consequences that go with the job. And you have to move forward. To me, this was really uh, depicting character in a way that I had not really seen it before. Because not only is it not putting himself ahead of them, he's saying character is based upon following through with what I say I'm going to do and why I'm here to do it. I'm not doing it to show off. I'm not doing it to be a flyboy. I am doing it because this is what I was called to do. True character. Finally, empowerment. This is obviously very important for any servant leader. You've got to keep your employees, as Admiral Bauckham would say, informed why their job is important to accomplish the organization's mission. This is why he said as he was stewarding that mission that he wanted to make sure that those employees were going to submit themselves to this mission and that he wanted, as they submitted themselves to the mission and submitted themselves unto his leadership, then he was submitting himself unto their followership. Everybody's position on the ship is important. He said, we would not be here if it wasn't. So even the guy that's down there frying the bacon, he said, knows that his contribution to this mission is important. It's important that servant leaders then communicate to the crew and let them know that they are important. I thought, wow, that is a powerful a statement, a powerful testament to what it is to be a true servant leader, to be sure that the people who you are leading are following, because no leader is a leader unless he or she has followers. But you're not going to have followers unless and until you can convince them that you are who you say you are, and you're going to do what you're going to, what you say you're going to do, and you're going to do it with the utmost character, utmost integrity, uh, and utmost belief in them as individuals. Now, here are some pros and cons of servant leadership, and you can find these uh, in, in all of the academic literature and non-academic literature, and, and I pulled a few of these uh, off of various uh, uh, sites just to show what some of the uh, pros and some of the individuals who uh, believe in and, and uh, study and practice servant leadership and, and those who may be somewhat questionable about it. Uh, I think all of these are important. I think I would, I would highlight a couple of them. Uh, on the pro side, I think it builds a much deeper trust-based relationship. If anything is at the heart of what is servant leadership, it is trust, it is integrity, it is character, it is to suggest, it is not to suggest, it is to declare to those who are under your guidance and under your direction and under your leadership that you trust them and you want them to trust you. Uh, the third one, it develops a very people-focused culture. It's not around you. It's not the John Wayne heroic Julius Caesar uh, you know, 
uh, Douglas MacArthur uh, notion of what is leadership. It is the leadership that says you are important, you meaning who you are leading. It boosts morale in so many ways. When those followers, those employees, those workers understand that you truly have their back and that you do what you say you're going to do, then this is going to boost the morale. It's going to impact the culture. It's going to impact the environment uh, of the organization. Uh, and you're going to see greater performance. You're going to see greater improvement uh, all across the board. There can be some cons, can be some difficulty in communication. It's certainly more time consuming to be a servant leader than it is to simply be a very Weberian top-down leader. I think what this tells you is that when you're committed to servant leadership, you're committed for the long term because you can't lead as a servant uh, and simply bellow orders and then walk off. You need to not even bellow. You need to give orders and directives, and then you need to make sure that they are followed through. And if that means you have to show them how to do that, as Admiral McCarthy did when he went down in the bilge and found some of the lost tools and says, if you need more, I'll get them, but let's do this and do this right, then that's what it's going to take. Sometimes formal authority, uh, experts would argue, can be diminished in that sense because there seems to be a blending of what is formal authority or positional authority and non-formal or non-positional authority, that is leader-follower relationship or what some experts would, uh, scholars would refer to as collaborative relationship. But I'm not even sure if I would necessarily say that is per se a uh, negative or a con, because in the long run, we need authority, whether it is in a positional basis or whether it's in a leader collaborator or a leader follower relationship. So in a nutshell, uh, what we saw and what we found was that these, both these admirals, these servant soldiers, espoused the values of servant leadership. They produced a lifelong cumulative record of accomplishment. It wasn't done in one day, one week, one month, one year, but over a 30 to 40 year lifespan. And uh, it also told us uh, four things. Then I'm going to stop there. Uh, it told us that servant leadership is organically developed. It doesn't just come out of a, of a, in a rigid box-like way of leadership. Uh, it's a lifelong process. It's a growth process. It's authentic and it's sustained because it's based upon values. It's based upon principles. It's based upon virtues that motivate uh, and demonstrate methods and processes and ultimately the end result. And finally, it is growth-based. In other words, no servant leader should ever tear down individuals. You should always build them up. Not only build them up, but building yourselves up and even your peers, those who are on like uh, standing as you are, other uh, leaders of rear admirals or other CEOs or other executive directors of nonprofits or other agency directors of public organizations. So I see servant leadership in... Uh, a way that I believe is critical to the leadership necessary for public and nonprofit organizations, um, values-based organization, value-based leadership for organizations of today and in the future. Well, thank you so very much. I appreciate the opportunity to be able to have an opportunity to communicate uh, the the, the overview of this research on servant soldiers, and I look forward to our time together during the live uh, roundtable uh, opportunities. So thank you very much. God bless.